coming home 20 years after gives a funny sort of feeling. I can hardly recognize that this was my home. Others stop in Doro on the way to somewhere. I stop because it is my home. It has changed. My parents had a shop, grocery, drapery and bar then. I remember the shops of those days. Rows of drawers, brass scales, flower bins, open chests of tea, Half barrels of stout bottled once a week. Caps, boots, and Horrocks' shirts being sold to workmen on Saturday night. Doros on the Midland Plain. The woods are in a circle around it. Three rivers wander across the plain. Lying inside its magic circle of woods, it is a little estate town. My mother insisted that as a business town, Durrow was strangled by estates. There were no farmers to shop. Anyway, she preferred county council workers who were paid every week and paid her in turn. For farmers, she would have to wait until the harvest. Agents and estate officers lived here. A rough rectangle of houses and shops, inhabited mostly by estate workers. An estate town, settled since the time of Ireland's first plantation, the reign of Philip and Mary. In our town, Catholic and Protestant live side by side. I went to school first in the convent, almost beside the Protestant church. Castle Durrow, the home of the Flower family, Baron Castle Durrow and Viscounts Ashbrook. They left after the First World War and the house was bought by the nuns in the 1920s. A Queen Anne house built in 1716. Inside, elegant plasterwork and a classic grandeur. The first Lord Castle Dora was a friend of Dean Swift's, who called on him here and described Captain Flower's fine new house built on arches. Almost the last who lived here was a gentle dilettante, Lord Louis, who designed stained glass windows. Locals recognize some of the models. He built the organ in the church at the end of the avenue. My first schoolroom was the billiard room, and this is where I began my education. And also the start of my fascination with Castle Doro House, with the Ashbrooks, with the whole history. Now, there's a girl who wasn't in this room for me to hold her hand at that time, but she was a few years later, Mary Bow, now known as Sister Catherine. You too served your apprenticeship, was it in high babies or low babies here? I have a feeling that we call them Seymour infants. Oh, that was a more discreet yes, way of putting we it, were. but there were high babies that I remember. I didn't feel myself a senior infant. High baby was as far as up as I went. Uh, have you any particular memories of this room, Sister Catherine? My memories are more of the other room where the 
junior infants were, or the low babies, in, when I began to school towards the end of the 1930s. And I think my worst memory was of a long, gaunt lady who taught us for a few weeks and really frightened us. And my most pleasant ones were of a nun, Mother Claire, who always kept a large gallon of sweets and who filled our two hands with hard-boiled sweets twice a day, generally. In fact, the sacred quarters upstairs where we were never allowed to go. I'm sure you were never allowed to go. <laughs> I know, yes, are, are now uh, classrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have boys up to six feet tall tramping through the top corridors. And um, there are classes in all the rooms, in fact, in every available space. In the harsher days of my boyhood, there was none of that running around. When we were bold, we were threatened with being sent through the mysterious baize door and down the black hole. The land acts came, the estates disappeared. By the 30s, the old economic system in Doro had broken down. There were still five or six great houses around. One such was Clonagira, a dower house of the flower family. I remember one coachman a number of chauffeurs in stately uniforms, and many gardeners. The woods were our happy hunting ground through autumn and winter, the new forestry woods as well as the old estate woods. In the 18th century, one of the Trench family of Haywood near Ballinakill built for himself a fine Georgian house, much admired by travelers who passed the way. As boys coming here on bicycles, we admired it too. It had Chinese wallpaper, fanciful ceilings, a most impressive library. Later, it became a Salesian college. The great house burned down in the 1940s. A new college was built in its place. Only the Italian garden, designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, remains. The remnant of that decayed elegance that haunted my boyhood is found in this Italianate garden, with its flagged walks, its pleached limes, its round ells, To smooth the lawn, to decorate the dale, to swell the summit, or to scoop the vale, to mark each distance through each opening glade, mask kindred tints, or vary shade from shade, to bend the arch, to ornament the grot. In all, let nature never be forgot, her varied gifts with sparing hand combine. Paint as you plant, and as you work, design. Milestone pillars from a road in Arcady, signposts of a never never world. The sheer trifling elegance of one of the owners here. With more money than sense, he improved the landscape hereabouts by moving hills from place to place. He also despoiled the ancient abbey of Ahabo, 
to decorate his avenue with Gothic follies. When I come home, it is pleasant to talk to a man who's been here all the time, Dr. Liam Bannon, the town's doctor, historian, and encourager of good works. All the merchants here seem to be doing very well at the moment. Mm -hmm. We have, of course, among other things, we have ready mix here, which means a lot to the employment of the town. Yeah. Well, then all the shops nearly in the town employ somebody. Yeah. And that means a lot to the town. Some people employ three and four and five people. Well, when you arrived, the estates were breaking up or had broken up at the time? Breaking up, they were ready to leave. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them had left. Mm -hmm. And this must have put a great number of people out of jobs. I did. And then you had this uh, emigration to England of the younger folk. Mm -hmm. In my day, there was no such thing as a dole. There was no such thing as a children's allowances. There was no such thing as a widow's allowance. Mm -hmm. So that if a man was unemployed, the merchant just gave him the stuff on credit till he get a job. Mm -hmm. He tried to get a job and he failed for maybe weeks and weeks, but still the merchant gave him his, mm -hmm. his groceries on credit. Then you had the younger folk coming and they got discontented and they went across to England. Mm -hmm. And then some little money came back from yeah. England. As the years went on, you see, you had different uh, societies being formed in the town, which were a wonderful help to the town. You had the, the ICA, which was one of the foremost in the town. And that was responsible uh, for t the tidy towns. Mm -hmm. And the tidy towns brought prizes to Durrow in on different years. Yes. Then. From that, you had, um, later on, you had our Glorna Nail, mm -hmm. of which I am very proud. Mm -hmm. We, every year, have got some kind of a prize in yeah. Glorna Nail, yeah. and our ambition is to get the top all-over all prize. Yes. We're hoping for that. Mm -hmm. Durrow hasn't been an Irish town since the, at least the 17th century. Oh, definitely not, no. And but we were blessed, if you like, with our priests and with our teachers. Mm -hmm. They had a very national spirit, both bodies. Yeah. They were wonderful men. Well, directly in the economic field now, you have quite a development in such things as the Community Council, haven't you? You have. The Community Council is doing wonderful work here. Uh, their latest effort is now we have the buses, we have the express bus, which was passing right through Durrow, mm -hmm. but stopping in Abilese. Mm -hmm. And naturally, the people were annoyed. Uh, Dolly and I went up to Dublin and we met two representatives from CIE. We met, first of all, uh, Mr. Pender, who is the deputy road traffic manager, and Mr. O'Brien. And we put the whole case out to them very, very fully. And they were very understanding. We feel that since the railway service was discontinued, that bus is very important. Mm -hmm. Now the situation is that uh, a person can go up to Dublin, say, on Monday morning from here. They can't get back in the evening because the first train back in the evening uh, arrives later than the bus leaves. Then on Tuesday there's no bus up in the morning and there's no bus home in the evening and it's the same right through the week. So really from the point of view of using uh, CIE to go to Dublin as far as the train is concerned, uh, that service is really of no use to us at all. The strange thing Talk about a prophet being without honour in his own country. How did Eamon Rafter, the president, hit on CIE, my employer, for tonight's agenda? One man without transport problems is my oldest and nearest friend, Michal Dempsey, the town's postman. This must be a great improvement since your Uncle Jim's time going around on the bike. You've got this car now for the round. Indeed it is, Sean, yeah. 
he went around on a bike for 49 to 50, to, well, just 50 years, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And that I often saw him coming in the water running out of him, you know. It is a great comfort to have the car and big improvement, as you say. But this it has is. been a great tradition with your family. Ah, post. yes. Yes, it has indeed. Sure, my grandfather was on the post too. Uh, between the, my two uncles, my grandfather and myself, we have 148 years service with the post office. I was going around the town there and looking at the old yards that we used to play in. Things have changed an awful lot. All the old yards seem to be gone. Do you remember Flanagan's yard with the glass and the timber we used to play around there? Indeed, I do. All the fun we used to have on the long shed in your yard, remember? And they, um, we, we, we fancied ourselves as um, actors when we used to put on the plays. Remember? <laughs> I remember going down, um, down to the storage yard on a Wednesday afternoon when the butcher used to kill the cattle. Ah, yes, Jim Kiley. We used to watch the blood. They used to poleaxe them in them days. Remember that? Yeah. I used to be a bit terrified, though. You, you were more braver. Yeah, well, you always went up and you looked in when Jim used to be drawing the poleaxe and the poor unfortunate animal used to fall to the ground and be kicking for a while. The Did mill yard is a sad sight now. Your family were connected with the mill. Ah, yes, uh, they were. Yes, they worked for David Mercier, you know, in the early days and that sort of thing. I remember Dick used to be on the lorry. That's yeah. right, yeah, and Mick used to work in the office and also Dick's wife used to work in the office, my Aunt Sarah, mm -hmm. and they had done the clerical end of the, the business. I remember the staff there. I remember Charlie Evans. He was one of the last in it. There was only a few in it in our time. Yeah. And then afterwards, when they closed the mill, of course, we used to play around the mill yard and the weir. That's right, we used to break into the mill, take some of the boards off of the windows and go up along up to the fifth or sixth story. I forget how many stories now was in it, but we used to have great fun down there, all right. It was yeah. a great place for children. The flour mill and the old sawmill were Durrow's only industries. To bridge the gap their closure caused, a Durrow man, Joe Brophy, started a small concrete block plant, which has flourished into the ready mix factory. What is the significance to Duro today? Basically, the importance, as far as I would be concerned personally, would be the continuity of the whole setup. Under me, the business, by virtue of the fact that I had no children, would probably die with me. And, uh, of course, with a firm of the nature of Ready Mix, I would say that this is the most important factor, the continuity, the future for the people of Dora and the employees in particular. When you consider that the total population of Dora is six to seven hundred, and that we employ roughly 40 people here, paying a weekly wage bill of two to three thousand, it means uh, makes a significant factor in the town as far as employment and finances are concerned. We produce in the region 10 to 12,000 blocks per day, which would uh, probably mean three houses. Harold Lawler and his wife came to Durrow to work an estate garden. Mrs. Lawler asked me forthrightly what I was saying about those who put Durrow on the map. She and her husband took a rundown garden and created a modern garden centre. The more I thought of it, the more I liked the idea. So we came in, we rented the garden from her, and we started from scratch. Oh, it was a desperate place. My boys, Two of them are here now, and the elder boys. We started work here in the mornings at five o'clock and worked until eight. And at night, we came in here after my husband finished work and the job he had. He worked out the road about five miles, and we'd work here until it was dark. So it was getting a little bit too much for us, so we decided to take the plunge and start out on our own. Through the great help of our local doctor, Dr. Bannon, he gave us a flat and the little bit of independence we needed. That was a roof over our head. When you have a family of small children, that's what started Doro and the garden centre. Now, it started very small. This shop that you're standing in now was an old shed with a galvanised roof, a big hole in the middle, the wall at the end out. I thought it was marvellous. To me, it was terrific. And when our, inter when our interflora 
Fieldman came to see it. He was horrified at me looking for my membership back in this awful dump. I couldn't understand why he thought it was a dump to me. It was wonderful. Now I can laugh back on that. So we kept improving it, badgering the bank manager for more money all the time. <laughs> and we have, with the help of our wonderful family of boys and girls, we now have the nursery we have. I love it. I really love it. My husband says the only time I'm happy is when I'm up to my tonsils like this, you know. But he's also a wonderful gardener. He's the best there is, as you can see from the stuff he grows. Flowers in Duro always remind me of church services. As an altar boy, I was a minor official. Holy Week was busy with ceremonies. A solemn dead mass was a great affair. Corpus Christi was a glorious summer adventure. There were scholarly priests. Canon Carrigan, before my time, had written the great book, The History of the Diocese of Ossory. The Protestant church across the square was as much part of the town as the chapel. 10 to 15% of the population were Protestant. I remember the day I guarded our camp while my pals, Arthur and Bobby Hovenden, had to go to a Bible exam. There were some disadvantages in being a Protestant. Canon Wills was as much my rector as Canon Aylward was my parish priest. I said Hail Mary's at his wake, and my mother bought a large part of his library, which is why in my boyhood I read Westminster Sermons and The Water of Life. The present rector was the spokesman on buses at the community council meeting. His wife takes the physical education class at the convent school. Right up to me. Never yeah, can do that single line again, coming up in a single line, right? It's not such a long way to Tipperary down the road from Durrow. But I went further afield. I became a teacher, a journalist, an editor, a publicist. I met many writers, including my friend the poet Thomas Kinsella. He visited Durrow with me many times. I particularly remember an evening of summer lightning when we floated down many miles of river. This is the background to his fine poem, Downstream. Past whispering sedge and river flag that line the shallow marshlands wheeling on our furrow and groups of alder mowing like the blind by root and mud bank, otter slide and burrow, the river bore us with a spinal cry of distant plover to the woods of Durrow. Our chill shades adapting to bench and oar, we turned on Durrow wood a weary face. The channel shrank, 
thick slopes from shore to shore, lowered a matted arch and moved our roots, full of slant pike over the river floor. And then impended a wall of ancient stone that turned and bared a varied barrenness as towards its base we glided, blotting heaven as it towered, searching the darkness for a landing place.